Okay, uh, hello everybody and welcome to my talk about contract testing of WebSockets. So the first, uh, a couple of introductional words about me and about the company I represent here. So uh, my name is Artem Demchenkov. I'm a CTO and a co-founder of Billy. And Billy is an innovative financial platform coming from Berlin, Germany. And uh, basically we are a fintech startup and we are focused on uh, working capital financing, whatever it means. So what we actually do, there are a couple of products which we have. The first one is the purchase on invoice and also the invoice factoring platform, which we provide to our B2B customers. So uh, if you guys are familiar with Klarna, and I'm sure you do, so that's what we also do. We have some common business lines. But what's interesting about our company it's uh, that half of the company, as you can see, are engineers. So we are really tech-driven company, and this means we have lots of different technical challenges. And uh, one of them I want to show you, uh, share with you today. So let's have a look at our front-end and back-end communication process. As you could see, we don't use the standard HTTP approach with request and response. Instead of this, uh, at least what's related to the user data, we try to push immediately and actively from the backend to the frontend. So there are three main components involved into this process. There is a frontend, there is a backend, and there is a push server in between. And the process looks like that. The first step, the frontend needs to establish the WebSocket connection. The second step, it needs to send the user data as a first message into the WebSocket, and the user data are the user ID and the API key of the user. When it's done and when it's valid, push server needs to authenticate the user. So it says, okay, I store this data in my memory and I will keep it unless the WebSocket connection is broken or actively closed by the client. And then whenever anything related to this user happens on the backend uh, to the user data, it gets immediately sent to the API endpoint on the push server side, and then it gets transferred to the web so through the WebSocket to the front end. And some interesting facts about the push server. First fact, it's written on Erlang, and it's a bit pleasure for me to uh, speak about Erlang here in Sweden where it was born. And the second fact is push server is not super smart and it should not be smart because what it needs to do, it needs just take the data which are coming from the backend and send to the front end. It doesn't need to know what's inside. And uh, so far so good. It's good to have such solution. It has some benefits. It also has some disadvantages. But the main disadvantage which we could see here, there is a single very important point of failure is the push server. What happens if it fails? If it simply fails and it's not able to transfer the data or it's not able to accept the connections from the front end. So that's why we need to test this process automatically and we need to be sure that it's always working. So these are the testing approaches which we use at our company. We do unit testing based on PHP unit because uh, most of our microservices are written on PHP except a couple of ones which are written on Go. We also do functional testing using BHAT, PHP unit, and also Go testing libraries. We do end-to-end -end testing with Selenium. We do API testing with Postman. We do contract testing with PACT, load testing, penetration testing, and even chaos engineering monkey testing approach also we also have. So if you look at this list, we could see that there is one approach which is really useful for testing of WebSockets, and this is packed contract testing. I don't want to talk a lot about this because there was already a talk about it today and we already know how it works. I just want to uh, mention a couple of main topics, a couple of main points. So there are as well three important parts involved the consumer of data, the provider of data, and there is a mock server in between. The consumer of data expects to send a certain request and expects to get back the certain response. And same for provider, it expects to get the certain request and send back the data in a certain response format. And uh, this 
integration, let's say, between those two services are written in a special data unit, which is called interaction. And the mock server in between is responsible for managing these interactions. So if you look at this schema, and if you look back into the schema which I showed you before, we see that the contract testing is a perfect way to test WebSocket communication. So what makes it possible? Backend is a provider of data. Frontend is a consumer of data. Push server in between is a unit which is responsible for the communication between those two, the same as mock server. And there are two main interactions happening. The first one is the WebSocket connection and authorization, and the second one is the push from the backend to the frontend. What else makes it possible is the Erlang world view, which is described by Joe Armstrong, one of the co-inventors of Erlang. And inside of Erlang OTP, inside of virtual machine of Erlang, everything is a process. And when I say everything, this is exactly everything. Any operation is unique and it has the process ID. So if we know the, the process ID, we could send a message to this process. And the processes itself do only what they're supposed to do or they just fail. And this is perfect for us if we want to test something because we know that either the result will be positive or there will be a failure. So knowing this, that's how the schema of contract testing will look like. We have three separate processes involved. The first one is a test process, and this is actually the main process which is responsible for managing the other two. So first thing which it does, it starts the push server. Second thing, it starts the client. Then knowing the PID of the client, it sends to the uh, to the client, it sends the interaction, please send the authentication data of the user to the push server. And then afterwards, it produces the verification. And then the same thing, other way around, from the test itself, which plays as a backend at this point in time, to the consumer through the push server. And then afterwards, when the testing is done, of course, it needs to do some cleanup. So it needs to stop the push server, it needs to stop the consumer and close the WebSocket connection. But it's not here on this schema because otherwise this will look overwhelmed. So far so good, but probably the question which you have to me is stop talking and show us some code. And let's have a look at this. So I'll still keep this open. And in parallel, I will open the code. So don't worry if the code of Erlang looks a bit unfamiliar. I'll explain everything what is happening here. So here, this is our test. It's a bit longer than 100 lines of code. So this function is the function which is responsible for setting up the test. So usually it's a function which in different languages is called differently, but it's run in front of any test. And what it does, it does the first two steps. It starts the push server and it starts the consumer. And then there is also a teardown function which does the opposite. Now, if we go to the test itself, to the code of the test, we see that the first step is we describe the first interaction. What we do is we say that we will send the UUID UNAS and the API key Unison to the backend, to the push server, sorry. And then as a response, we will get the phrase, you are welcome, you're logged in, Unis. Here, we actually run this interaction. We open the WebSocket connection. If we go here to this function, we see that we open an HTTP request to the backend and then we upgrade it to the WebSocket. And then afterwards, we send this, uh, this authentication message to the backend with this data of the user, Yunus Yunuson. And then the verification step is a very interesting step because here we open a listener. And as a parameters of this listener, we send the PID of the consumer, which we already know because we started it. And we say that for this PID, 
listen for messages which are coming, and the first message which comes will be the one which we described here. You are logged in, welcome, Yunus. Afterwards, we need to repeat the same steps for the interaction number two. So what we do here, we describe the interaction. There will be a message sent from the backend to the push server for the user Yunus Yunusan, Alan Carlson in the house. And then this message will be transferred to the consumer, and this will be consumed here. So here we will perform this POST request to the API endpoint with this data, this set of data. And then here we start another listener on the push server side, which will be listening for it and waiting for the message to come. And then afterwards, if everything is successful, we will just close the connection. And afterwards, we will uh, stop the push server and the consumer. So let's have a look at how it works. So here I have my make file in the di directory with the push server. And in order to run tests, I need to, I need to do gmake tests. So done. As we could see, one test is OK and zero failures. And here we see two messages which are, which are presented. The first one is, you are logged in, welcome, Yunus. And the second one is, Alan Carlson in the house. So let's change the test a bit and make it fail. And for this, in the second interaction, we will change the message which is coming from the backend. So instead of Alan Carlson in the house, let's just type Carlson in the house without changing the expectation and run it again. So as you could see now, zero tests are OK. And there is one failure. And here is a description of this failure. And the push server is complaining. It complains, it says, no, no, it's not what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for Alan Carlson, this 100-year-old guy who escaped from this nursery house and started a chain of events. I'm not waiting for Carlson, who is this uh, flying guy with a button on the belly and a propeller, propeller on the backside. So here it complains. It, the error message is not super clear, but at least we know where, is, where the error is, we know the line of the code. And if we fix it back and run it again, this will work. Yeah, everything is fine again. One test is OK, zero failures. So let's get back to the presentation. The only question which is left, and the question which you may ask me, is what to do if not everything is a process? What to do if we are not in this nice virtual machine of Erlang, and we could not manage the processes, and we don't know the PIDs? For example, what to do if we are in PHP world? And the solution will be exactly the same, with the only one difference. So instead of running the consumer as a separate process, test would need to instantiate the object. So for example, for PHP, there is a WebSocket client which is called Ratchet. And what test needs to do, it just needs to create an object. And this object will be responsible for handling the connection to the push server. And the rest is happening exactly the same way as you could see on this schema. So I hope this approach of uh, testing your WebSockets will be helpful for you. And thank you very much. And before we go, don't forget to check out our engineering blog. There are interesting articles. This uh, talk was also described there. Thank you very much. <laughs>